So again, welcome everybody. We're so glad you're here and it's fantastic to have you joining us tonight here at the opening event for our Women and Philanthropy series here at the College of Worcester. Thank you all so much for being with us. This is a really exciting series. It's sponsored by our Office of Advancement, the Create Her program here at Apex and the College of Worcester as a whole. We're thrilled for the opportunity to highlight the work of our alumni across the country and around the world to create profound impact on our campus as well as in their local communities and around the world. So this is a four part series, the first of a four part series. And tonight you're gonna to hear from women who bring a diverse set of experiences and backgrounds and viewpoints on philanthropy, on the impact of that philanthropy and on how they select causes and organizations, how they've turned their passion for helping others into careers. Tonight, we're gonna to begin with research from the experts because you know this is the College of Worcester we are always going to begin with the research and we're so fortunate tonight to have with us Jeannie Sager and Jacqueline Ackerman both from the renowned Women's Philanthropy Institute at the Indiana University Lilly Family School of Philanthropy. Thank you so much for joining us. By understanding what their research demonstrates about the differences that gender makes in how and why people give, we can more fully comprehend the potential for even greater impact of philanthropy, both in the United States and around the world. As women continue to gain a larger and larger portion of the world's wealth, and create transformative impact through their giving, it's really important that we understand and recognize the collective impact that women are making and that we have that chance to highlight Worcester alumni who are making a difference at Worcester and in their communities. As you're gonna to hear tonight, gender matters in philanthropy. We're proud to bring this series to current students and to alumni, as well as to staff and faculty here at the college. In addition, over the course of our series, we're gonna be joined by student moderators and by advancement staff from our campus. And just as we're jumping in, I wanna invite you, whatever your connection is to Worcester as a student, an alumna, a faculty or staff member, a friend of the college, I hope that you might consider joining our Fighting Scots Career Connections platform so that you can continue the exciting kinds of connections that we're making here tonight and throughout this program with fellow alumni and students. You can easily and quickly join by visiting WorcesterAlumni.org. And when you do that, you'll get a follow-up email that encourages you to join the platform and helps you connect with our series speakers and attendees and other members of the College of Worcester community. So just before I introduce our speakers, and it's really my privilege to do that, I want to say one last very special thank you to everyone, to all of you who have done so much to continually support Worcester through your philanthropy and volunteer efforts. What you do is so important, so important to us all the time, and especially as we confront and navigate challenges as we have in the most recent year. Your gifts to the Worcester Fund are allowing us to respond to the opportunities and needs that are ahead of us, to the things that are most important to our students as they continue to have this extraordinary experience of a Worcester education, despite the challenges of the pandemic. In addition, your work as volunteers helping us interview prospective students, host events, connecting classmates back to Worcester, all of those ways that you knit together the fabric of the Worcester community and make it stronger, both for students today and for the students of tomorrow and generations to come is hugely important and deeply, deeply appreciated by all of us. Thank you so much. And now it's my privilege to introduce and tell you a little bit about tonight's speakers all of whom are on your screen. So first we have Jeannie Sager. Uh, Jeannie is the director of the Women's Philanthropy Institute, which as I said, is housed under the Indiana University Lilly Family School of Philanthropy in Indianapolis, Indiana. The WPI, that is the, Williams, uh, the Women's Philanthropy Institute, believes that gender matters in philanthropy and that solving the world's complex problems is gonna require the perspective and the leadership and the generosity of people of all genders. 
WPI is focused on conducting and disseminating research that grows women's philanthropy. And Jeannie leads the WPI's efforts to translate research into practice. She works closely with the, the National Advisory Council for the WPI and serves on the executive leadership team for the Lilly Family School of Philanthropy. Welcome Jeannie, we're so glad you're with us. Jeannie is a seasoned nonprofit executive with 25 years of experience in many sectors in healthcare and higher education and in independent school leadership. She earned her master's in philanthropic studies from the Lilly School and her bachelor's in international relations from Rollins College. Next, we have Jacqueline Ackerman. Jacqueline is the Associate Director of Research at the Women's Philanthropy Institute, and Jackie supports WPI's vision by managing all of the facets of WPI's research, which is primarily supported by a grant from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Jacqueline joined the Lilly Family School of Philanthropy in 2012 after earning her master's in public administration from the Indiana University Bloomington School of Public and Environmental Affairs. She was raised in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, and has recently moved to Bethesda, Maryland. Welcome, Jacqueline. We're so glad you're with us. And then finally tonight, also joining us uh, is Worcester's own Marie Nahas, class of 2010. Marie joined the advancement team in April of 2018. She serves as a major gift officer uh, based out of Hartford, Connecticut. She's currently the co-class president for her class of 2010, and she was formerly also a member, a very valued member of our board of trustees at the college. So again, welcome to all of our panelists. Thank you so much for joining us. Welcome to all of our guests. We're really looking forward to tonight's conversations. And as a reminder, for those of you who are participating and, and listening to tonight's conversations, if you have questions, you can feel free to ask them in the chat. And you should also know that our event will be recorded. Thank you so much. Welcome, everybody. We're really looking forward to tonight and to this series as a whole. Thank you so much, President Bolton. And thank you so much to the College of Worcester team for bringing uh, Jackie and I here this evening. I am going to share my screen, which is always just a little bit um, Makes you a little nervous, but hopefully I will get this right. All right, I think we're ready to go. I'm here, I see a, um, some nodding heads. So let's get started. Again, thank you so much for having us here today. It is such an honor and a privilege to be with all of you this evening. Um, as President Bolton shared, my name is Jeannie Sager and I have the privilege of serving as a director of the Women's Philanthropy Institute. Um, and, as, and for those of you who may not be familiar with uh, what we affectionately call WPI, we are the only research institute in the world de dedicated solely to the study of gender and philanthropy. And we are housed at the Indiana University Lilly Family School of Philanthropy, which is also the only school of philanthropy um, in the world. So as President Bolton shared, if you take anything away from tonight's presentation, we hope it is this, that the bottom line is that gender matters in philanthropy. And today, we are going to take a quick trip through over two decades of WPI research to learn how it can inform your own philanthropy. And at WPI, we believe that to solve challenges, large and small, our world needs more strategic philanthropy. And Jackie and I are excited to share with you why we believe engaging better with women as donors will help women's philanthropy reach its full power and potential. So we women can lead this charge for more strategic philanthropy, harnessing their growing wealth and influence to create a more just, equitable, and healthy society. By most measures, today's demographics Demographic changes benefit women. You know this and you see it every day. More and more women have increased access to education, income, and wealth. And these are key predictors of philanthropy. At the same time, more women are the primary breadwinner in their families. More women are financially independent. And some reports suggest that 90% of women are the chief financial officer of their households. And these factors are central to women's expanding role in philanthropy. Women's wealth is rising. 
Today, women hold about 40% of global wealth. And the Boston Consulting Group says that by 2025, women will have accumulated assets worth $110 trillion. And women are expected to inherit 70% of the wealth that will be passed down over the next two generations. And women tend to inherit twice, once from their parents and then from their spouse. Women are also more likely to give. And our research at WPI shows that women's growing wealth is good news for the philanthropic sector. Across all ages, races, and income levels, women give more and give differently than their male counterparts. Not only that, but we found that the more women's wealth grows, the more they will give to charitable organizations. And how women think about wealth differs too. According to a US trust study, women are nearly twice as likely as men to say that giving to charity is the most satisfying aspect of having wealth. And so in order to unlock the full potential of women's philanthropy, we must understand how gender shapes giving behavior. To build a powerful and diverse force of female philanthropists, we need to know more about what drives women to give. And the Women's Philanthropy Institute exists for that reason, to conduct, curate, and disseminate rigorous research that grows women's philanthropy. WPI's focus is on research about gender and philanthropy, but this field of study is reasonably new. WPI released its first study in 2010, and few studies before that considered gender as a factor in its work. Since 2010, though, we have built an amazing reservoir of findings that point to one undeniable fact. Gender matters in philanthropy. But it seems intuitive, doesn't it? After all, men and women are different in so many ways. Let's just look at the field of fundraising. It was created in the 1960s at a time when men, predominantly white men, were presumed to be the primary donor. That is no longer true. In fact, in 2020, your average donor is a 64-year-old white woman. Donors are men and women. They are all ages, races, ethnicities, sexual orientations, religions, and no religion, local and across the globe. Fundraising strategies must adapt to the changing environment and understand that men and women have different motivations for giving and different patterns of giving. One is not better than the other. They are simply different. And women are driving philanthropy today in bold ways at the grassroots level, in corporate boardrooms, as individual philanthropists, in giving circles, and as leaders in nonprofits. The best is yet to come as more women step fully into their philanthropic power and bring others alongside them. Our research spans a range of topics from retirement to giving circles to impact investing to the transmission of generosity. And across these topics, we apply a gender lens to better understand where, how, and why women and men give differently. And our entire body of research can be found online at our website. And I encourage you to explore and engage in our work. And so before we explore some of our research to address the who, how, why, where, and what, let's talk about the common barriers to women's giving. I wanna spend some time challenging some myths about women's giving. The first one is that women don't think of themselves as philanthropists. And we're gonna talk about this more later in the research, um, but women are drawn to a more expanded definition of philanthropy beyond just giving money. So we really want to uplift and share role models of women philanthropists throughout history to challenge the idea of who gets to define and who and what a philanthropist looks like and, and adding important names and faces to the narrative like Madam C.J. Walker or Jane Addams or Candy Leitner who started uh, Mothers Against Dunk Driving or Nicole Robinson. So women don't feel ownership of the family money. This may particularly be the case if women have never worked outside the home or gave up careers to focus on the family. 
We know that with the pandemic, many articles have recently come out with men working from home, finally realizing the value of all the labor their partners have managed and continue to manage. Third, outliving resources. A less delicate way of putting this is the bag lady syndrome. So we hope that this begins to go away as more women are more confident about financial education. No matter how much money some women have, they are afraid of becoming a burden to others. The fourth myth, women defer to men in their decision-making. When women defer to men in their decision-making or give only to the interests of their male family members, again, with a better understanding of their family's finances, women can overcome um, how to gain equal footing. And the research shows that women, as I mentioned, are the chief financial officers for the majority of household decisions. And why would philanthropic decisions be any different? For some women, only a life-changing event, such as a divorce or death, uh, changes the outlook of women who have this barrier. But when it does, it is a significant life event. Fifth, women want anonymity. We hope that role models like Mackenzie Scott and Melinda Gates and Dr. Priscilla Chan will usher a new era for women and giving, where we encourage women to put their name out in public and enjoy the gift during their lifetime. And lastly, women's financial advisors don't encourage them to give to charitable causes. Again, with rising wealth, encouraging women to take control of the conversation that they are having with wealth advisors and research financial advisory firms that match their values or provide philanthropic advisory counsel is just going to increase. And the research that WPI did on impact investing in particular sheds light on how women are becoming more savvy about all the different ways that they can use their wealth to support missions and causes that they care about. But the biggest barrier to so far to women's giving, women aren't asked to give. And we are gathered here today to challenge this notion and explore what the research tells us that can help women to step fully into philanthropy by understanding how and why they give. And I'm excited to uh, bring my colleague, Jackie Ackerman, into the conversation to uh, go over the research with all of you. Jackie. Great. Thank you, Jeannie. And thank you to you all for, for your time today. I'm so thrilled to be with this group. Uh, so I will review uh, a couple decades of research um, in a few minutes. So bear with me and, and of course, happy to answer any questions after the presentation. So let's start with the who, so demographics. Who is philanthropic um, and how do these different demographic factors affect giving by women and men? So when we look at how factors like age, family dynamics, marital status and income influence giving by women and men, the bottom line is that women, so all women across racial and ethnic lines, across generations and age, are more likely to give compared to their male counterparts. And the data about women, especially comparing single women and single men, is really compelling. So some examples are um, across race and ethnicity and income, single women are more likely to give than single men. When looking at age across generations, Gen X and millennial single women are holding their own in terms of giving compared to older boomer or pre-boomer women from several decades ago. Giving trends seem to hold true across the life cycle. So even at the point of retirement, we found that single women and married couples are more likely to give and give higher amounts compared to single men and single women also volunteer more than single men at that point in life and throughout life. Marriage affects giving in positive ways. So we know from our research that being married or being in a cohabitating partnership increases both the likelihood that you'll give and the amount of giving. So shorthand, marriage is good for charitable giving. Married and cohabiting couples tend to give more to charity compared to single men or even single women. And while most couples make charitable giving decisions jointly, women are more likely than men to be the sole decider when one person does decide for the household. 
And in our Women Give 2020 report from last year, we found that this holds true both offline and online. So more women than men give gifts on social media and online platforms. Women are drawn to an expanded definition of philanthropy. In our Women Give 2019 report, we encouraged women from all backgrounds to fully understand that diverse acts of generosity are represented in that term philanthropy. So for women, philanthropy can encompass both formal and informal definitions of the word, all of it rooted in this idea of generosity broadly or giving back. Research shows that women tend to give more than money and they're using other resources, their time, their expertise, their voice in terms of advocacy and their ties, their networks to apply all of their resources to work for good. This is especially important in communities of color where women can be seen as bridge builders within philanthropy, embracing a rich and broad definition of philanthropy and using their giving to celebrate and support their own communities. Many women are interested in building a relationship with an organization. Um, that might be through volunteering, leadership, or educational opportunities before giving to it. And so you have this misconception that women are just really hard uh, donors to reach and, and it takes so much time and effort, but really it's just that the um, investment goes in reverse sometimes. So women are investing their time and their voice in an organization before investing their money. Once women are engaged, they do tend to be more loyal donors, giving more over time to the causes where they are actively engaged beyond just giving dollars. So we started with the who, and now we are to the how. So behavior, how do women and men give? and which platforms and approaches do they use when it comes to their philanthropy. So our research shows broad gender differences in how women and men use the internet and social networks and specifically how they use those in their giving. Women use tech platforms more than men and give more than men online. On digital platforms and social media, women give nearly two thirds of total online gifts, more than 50% of total dollars, and they tend to give to smaller charitable organizations and smaller sized gifts. Charitable organizations, fundraisers, and digital platforms can engage a more diverse set of donors by adopting this broader definition of philanthropy. They can build trust with donors by helping donors to find causes that align with their preferences and help donors to foster community both online and in person. Uh, we conducted a study about Giving Tuesday donors a few years ago and found that women are more likely than men to give on that special day of giving. While giving goes up sharply for both men and women on Giving Tuesday, as you might expect, and they give approximately equal amounts, women's greater participation means that on Giving Tuesday, more dollars are coming from women donors. And women like to give together. With the exponential growth of giving circles over the last 10 years, women continue to comprise the majority of collective giving network members. About 70% of all giving circles report that women make up more than half of their membership. And giving circles are really a force to be reckoned with in philanthropy. Um, our landscape scan of giving circles was the first one in 10 years. Um, we looked at the number of giving circles in the US and found that that number tripled between 2007 and 2017. Giving circles have allocated almost $1.3 billion to local communities over the last 35 years. And while women are still a majority of giving circles, we see a lot of growth in the diversity of the ecosystem of giving circles. You have LGBTQ+, men only, Jewish, African-American, Asian-American, and Latinx groups forming. The growth of the giving circle movement has provided countless opportunities for women to lead in philanthropy. So with the help of giving circles, women have really stepped fully into these leadership roles. Uh, they are able to learn about their community. They're able to engage deeply with the nonprofits in their community. And in some cases, even working together in these groups to influence public policy. Um, one of our studies examining Giving Circle members showed that these women tend to tap their social networks more strategically for philanthropic advice. Compared to women who are not in Giving Circles, their philanthropic networks are also more diverse. 
Um, and further, our study affirmed that giving circle members um, give more, they give more strategically and proactively, they give to a wider array of organizations and causes, and they are more likely to engage in civic activity. So we talked about the who, we talked about the how, and now we'll go to the why, motivations. Why do women and men give? And how do those motivations influence their giving? Um, short answer is empathy. Empathy motivates women's giving. Uh, for men, giving is often more about self-interest. Um, I do want to be clear, it's not that men are not empathetic. Um, it's a matter of degree and priority. So women tend to be, as we know, socialized more into helping, nurturing, caring roles. This happens from a really young age. And so these behaviors become ingrained and become the basis for many of our actions. And that includes philanthropy. Empathy also drives women's deep engagement with nonprofits. Our research has shown that women are more likely to give to organizations where they have a personal connection or where they have alignment with political or philosophical beliefs. Single women are more likely than single men to cite being on a board or volunteering for an organization as motivations for their giving. In general, women are less motivated than men by tax advantages or public recognition, um, but they are highly motivated by connections to and volunteering for the causes they care about. Um, and so you see that a woman's gift of, of treasure, of, of her money um, is, is very important and connected to her other sorts of generosity, gifts of time, talent, testimony, and ties. So for women, language really matters, and we need to be careful to balance um, impact shared with facts and impact shared with stories. Um, and this needs to be really across the fundraising uh, cycle, from how you ask for money to how you continue to steward the gifts and the relationship. Um, as Jeannie touched on earlier, um, attitudes about wealth can really impact behavior. So you have the guardianship attitude toward wealth. It's more frequently seen in women who have received their wealth from sources like an inheritance, marriage, or a divorce. So because these women did not earn their wealth themselves in the strictest sense of the term, that is, they didn't receive their wealth through their personal direct participation in business or some other wealth producing creative endeavor. So some of these women um, with this guardianship attitude may feel that the wealth they've received is not truly theirs to dispose of as they personally think is best. And then on the contrary, we have the ownership attitude toward money, frequently seen among women who have earned their wealth or who otherwise have had the opportunity to exercise considerable control over their own finances and financial decisions. Um, and so this attitude is particularly the case for women who have experienced success as generators of their own wealth, um, either through paid work or active involvement as investors. Um, the, the idea is because they have been successful in earning wealth, they're more confident that they can create more wealth through their own efforts, and they clearly own their resources, and so these women are more likely to be more confident philanthropists. So how women and men who are wealthy uh, define their wealth really differs. Men tend to see wealth as a demonstration of their own life success, Women tend to see wealth as a means to an end, a means to pursue the paths that really fit their deepest core values. Um, wealth for women tends to provide this, this idea of security, freedom from worry, and women do not tend to see their accumulation of wealth as a form of power or status, but rather as a way to initiate positive change. So where do women and men give and how do certain factors uh, excuse me, affect the causes that they support? So before we get to women's and girls' causes, as seen on the screen, I'll talk a little bit about causes broadly. Outside of women's and girls' causes, women do tend to give more often and higher amounts to religion and to youth and family causes. When women give collectively, like in giving circles and other collective giving groups, they also tend to give to women and girls and education. So the commonality that we find across a number of studies is really that women tend to support causes they connect with personally in some way, uh, whether they have experience in that area or they can touch and see it, it's tangible in their communities. Women are more likely than men to give to women's and girls' causes. It's, it's fairly intuitive, but men still do give to these causes. Um, when they give to women and girls, men tend to be motivated to give by the women in their lives 
or by having a woman with a significant cause who is important to them. So we've heard men cite family members uh, who've had breast cancer, um, et, et cetera, those sorts of stories. So if you care about women's and girls' causes, it's important to increase your support because rising levels of giving matters. Um, we conducted a study on social norms and we learned that when men perceive that other women and men donate to women's and girls' causes, they themselves become more likely to donate. So people are paying attention and really following each other's examples when it comes to where to give. Prominent women philanthropists like Melinda Gates reveal a new era in women's philanthropy, where women are purposefully adopting platforms to leverage their philanthropy and exert influence on others. Melinda Gates and others are deliberate and intentional about their focus on giving to women and girls because there's room to grow this giving. So of all the charitable organizations in the US, um, we say only 47,000, it seems like a, a big number, but compared to the 1.4 million uh, charitable organizations in the US, it's only about 3.3% of charitable organizations in the US that are dedicated to women and girls. Um, and in terms of dollars, it's even lower. So just 1.6% of charitable dollars are received by women's and girls organizations. Of those organizations, the ones that are focused on women's health tend to receive the largest share of this support. So we've talked about a lot of things. Um, before I turn things back over to Jeannie, I just wanna share the so what of the research, the outcomes. So we've talked about who gives, why, where, how, um, what difference does giving make? What's the outcome? Um, and the short answer here is that giving makes us all happier. Giving is a satisfying process. Um, across the board, the more a household gives as a percentage of their income, the higher the household's life satisfaction. But men see the greatest increase in life satisfaction when they become donors. Um, single and married women see the greatest boost in life satisfaction when they increase their giving as a percentage of their income. So simply stated, men are happier when they give and women are happier when they give more. Hank Rosso, who is the founder of the fundraising school housed at the Lilly Family School of Philanthropy, liked to say that fundraising is the gentle art of teaching the joy of giving. And so as we all consider the work that all of you in the audience do to advance this institution and any other institution that you are involved in, rest assured that you are essentially in the joy delivery business. I will uh, turn things over to Jeannie to close us out. Thank you so much, Jackie. The research is powerful. Um, it allows individuals to connect their personal experiences to the broader philanthropic landscape. It, it provides empirical data to help change assumptions and change attitudes and behaviors around perceptions of who is philanthropic. It can be a tool to help women donors advocate for the kind of engagement that they wish to have with the nonprofits that they support, perhaps to open up more opportunities for board service and leadership or special events that are designed for them. And it can be a sounding board, a wake up call and a valuable resource to carry forward on your own philanthropic journey. Tangible, credible, empirical evidence of the vital role women play in philanthropy. So as you think about your work um, and your giving and how to better engage women. Here are some suggestions from our research for you to be more fully engaged and strategic. Ask her. Women do and can make big gifts and the research shows that this is happening across all generations. Engage both spouses and partners in the household and don't make assumptions about who is on lead regarding household or philanthropic decisions. Understand women's preferences with regards to stewardship and acknowledgement of their gifts. And as we said before, as we've said throughout the presentation, you know, it's all women want to use all of their resources um, um, when they consider their generosity. So be sure to involve women in your organization's work and help women, help them identify what they are most passionate about and raise their sights towards those kinds of gifts. Have the conversation, listen 
and respond appropriately. Be mindful and realize that women may take longer to, to decide about their giving and recognize that women are paying attention, especially when it comes to issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Not only in the stories that you tell, but also in leadership positions at your organization, especially on boards. And remember that women's social networks and word of mouth can be very powerful marketing strategies. Find reflecting on your own giving. Does it match your values and does it encompass all the ways that you give back? Be sure to place a value on your time and talent and testimony as a full picture of your philanthropy. And I encourage you to revisit your giving plan on an annual basis to help hold yourself accountable to this. And it's so important to model giving. In our 2018 Transmission of Generosity study, we found that this is especially important for daughters who are much more influenced by seeing their parents model giving and volunteering versus just being told to do so. And again, women give collectively. Are there opportunities or do you to, collaborate, be, to be collaborative with your giving? Or does your organization create opportunities for collaborative giving? And finally, there, every day there are new tools for people to think about giving. One example is impact investing. We found in our study that women use it to complement their giving, while men use it a lot of times to replace their giving. So really consider all the different ways that one um, can match their values uh, to, to the way that they demonstrate generosity um, in their lives. So philanthropy is growing. Knowledge about giving and how to give back is growing. Awareness of the importance of women and girls and those causes is growing. And a focus on individual giving continues to be paramount as the latest Giving USA report shows us that 70% of all giving comes from individuals. But when you consider bequests and then gifts that come from family foundations, this number uh, within terms of how individuals influence giving grows to nearly 86%. And demographics are shifting dramatically and philanthropy is becoming ever more elastic. So 15 years ago, researchers were just beginning to consider gender as a factor in charitable giving. And now we have over 130 data points that we can share with, that we wish we could share with you in just 15 minutes. So again, I encourage you to visit our website to learn more. All of our research reports um, and data are, are open sourced and free to the public. And finally, the research suggests that shifts in fundraising strategies to engage women and men in ways that appeal to each will help grow philanthropy. And while we can and should celebrate that in 2019, charitable giving was nearly $450 billion, just think about what this number could be if we were engaging more women. So women's philanthropy long the backbone of civic engagement continues to evolve. And today, women contribute their time, talent, pressure, and testimony in innovative, creative, and trailblazing ways. And more women among us are thinking about philanthropy and harnessing this power to do good. And given your interest in Wooster's uh, Women in Philanthropy series, you have the opportunity to put this growing body of research into practice and truly drive women's philanthropy forward. And before we go into our question and answer session, I'd like to share a video that was produced that gives you the opportunity to hear how this research plays out from philanthropists themselves. So let me get that teed up for you. When most people think about philanthropists, or even if you were to uh, Google it uh, and, and see what comes up, you'd see the historical context of, you know, Rockefeller and Ford, right? People are viewed as needing to be rich, 
multi-billionaires, millionaires, famous people. It feels a little bit like a itchy sweater in a way. I think of um, Bruce Wayne's parents. I think the term philanthropist has a connotation of old white man. Maybe like a, a MacArthur Foundation or a Rockefeller Foundation. Philanthropist, rich, wealthy, on TV, or organization, not just a regular person. I have been phenomenally fortunate and I think it's my responsibility to give some of that fortune back. And she would, you know, raise a certain amount of money and I would try to beat that and she'd go back and forth. So we would raise fifty, sixty thousand dollars Then I get to thinking like, well, what about the people who don't have a home to go to? Well, I couldn't help everyone, but the 30 rooms that I secure will at least help you know, a, a lot of them. Myself, along with uh, 33 other women, have decided to invest in the success of women and girls on the south side of Chicago. So we sold world's finest chocolate, and I had my box, and I went door to door and raised funds, and in some ways, that is being a philanthropist. I didn't know that you don't have to be rich <laughs> to be a philanthropist. But it's not a money that you always have to give. It's your time, your energy, your knowledge. It's giving what you can. People need to know they can each make a difference, even if you start in a small way. I've been, um, you know, really pleased that uh, Facebook, you know, has that charitable giving because my nephews and my nieces have done that for their birthday. And I think that's awesome. You can give someone a fish, right? You can show them how to fish, or you can revolutionize the fishing industry. And I think it's all good. It can be a woman, it can be a person of color, it can be someone who's young. I want to be able to recall more people who look like me. If we abandon that idea of what a philanthropist looks like, what a philanthropist have, what the power they have, the change they can make, and open that up and bust that door wide open, I think we um, have the potential uh, to create even greater change. I am a philanthropist. I am a philanthropist. I am a philanthropist. I'm a philanthropist. I am a philanthropist. I am a philanthropist. I am a philanthropist. I am a philanthropist. to end the presentation. I almost feel like I should start out saying that I'm a philanthropist to go on with the trend. Um, well, thank you, Jeannie and Jackie. Um, your presentation was fantastic. And as an advancement professional myself, I really appreciated your emphasis that gender matters and that you highlighted um, the fact that we must create leadership opportunities for women at our own institutions. Um, thank you again so much. Was, your presentation was fantastic. Um, so now we will move on to the question and answer portion. So please feel free to drop your questions in the Q&A box below, and we will get through as many as um, time allows. And so looks like we have a few already, um, but as the feed is being populated, we do have a few that were previously submitted during the registration portion. So we will get started on those first. So our first question is, our alumni body has become increasingly diverse at the college and as it's become more of a global institution. In what ways can we support our alumni of color in their philanthropic interests? So what we found um, um, across uh, research with regards to philanthropy and people of color across the board is that it's really important to meet people where they are. And so when you think about ways that you can support in particular alumni of color with regards to their philanthropic interests and efforts, you really need uh, to ask the right questions and have the conversation and realize that so much of that happens in very local 
localized community. So those, those leaders, those alumni leaders are really serving um, um, smaller communities. And so being able to, um, to highlight that um, and amplify their work, because right now, particularly in this current movement with regards to social justice and diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, we want to support um, um, certainly people of color who are leading um, efforts that tend to be less well known um, and amplified. Um, and so, and so, just to be able to use uh, the College of Worcester um, and that alumni work to leverage and celebrate and amplify the work that they're doing, um, that would be my my biggest recommendation in that space. Yeah, the, um, the phrase meet them where they are is something that we often use um, as it relates to our students because we want to ensure their success at the College of Worcester. Thank you so much for um, answering that question. So the next is what recommendations can you give on how to diversify your donor base? So this requires very intentional work. Um, and so um, having spent 25 years um, in, in fundraising um, and in uh, nonprofit um, you know, leadership space. I know that for some of our frontline um, fundraisers on the call um, and, and doing the work, sometimes we were pretty siloed. Um, and, and sometimes our, our, our what I like to, I, which is, I need to come up with a better term, but our back office, our, our back office team, that real, that real, the, from the real foundation of um, and critical, important work uh, for those folks who are out on the front line and talking with donors, sometimes there just needs to be better communication. And so when we're thinking about how to diversify your donor base, everybody has to be on board. And so again, back to that, um, what we just talked about, meeting people where they are, for, for donors of color in particular, and also for women, you know, they don't follow the general rules that, um, that standard fundraising today um, has been uh, the rules that it's been built on, right? So, so we have we have created artificial um, donor levels, dollar gift levels that you know have to be met before they uh, donors meet a certain certain threshold. Um, and so it's really reimagining. If, if we're very if you're committed to diversifying your donor base. Then it's really reimagining all of the work that you do, um, and being intentional about who you want to bring into the fold. And so it may require getting rid of uh, uh, donor minimums for societies. Um, and more importantly, as Jackie shared with regards to this, um, how women are are drawn to an expanded definition of philanthropy. So are donors of color. And so, what are ways you are inviting? all donors uh, to engage with your organization beyond just making a gift um, and, and understanding um, what that means at, e at, at each stage of when that gift, when that gift arrives. Becky, do you have anything to add? No, I, I do. I, I've, I've talked to a variety of audiences and what you said about the back office is so important. If, if you know, women um, and, and diverse groups of people are not on your list, of course, you're not going to call on them as fundraisers, and so it really kind of is is from that beginning stage to the end stage um, that that really matters. It, it's at all levels of, of your fundraising activity. You can't just blame, you know, the one fundraiser who happens to call on more men or more white men um, because he's working. You know, your fundraisers are working from lists uh, that they're provided, and and so it takes everyone on the team uh, really integrating that viewpoint. Sounds like communication is key and also that it's a multifaceted approach. It isn't something that we can rely on um, that we've been doing. We need to kind of reimagine uh, the work that we've um, set out to do. So the next question that we have um, asks, who gives more to mental health initiatives and to homelessness, women or men? And how can this knowledge inform our development team strategy? 
So I'll take a quick stab at this, but then I think Jackie, um, who's been engaged more with our Giving USA work, um, will have a, a much more <laughs> um, data-driven answer. Um, what I'll what I'll say is that, um, and so I'll, I'll get on a bit of a giving to women's and girls' causes <laughs> little soapbox, because the truth of the matter is, is that religion tops everything when it comes to giving. That is the largest recipient um, in terms of sector. Of, of, of giving, um, followed by education. And so really everything below that from mental health to homelessness, we're almost all on the same page. Um, and so for, I mean, really it's about making the pie bigger. So back to this idea of being more inclusive about who we are asking to engage with us in philanthropy and who we're going to give, as opposed to creating, um, you know, getting more, more of the pie, um, it's, it's a both and. Um, Jackie, what do you have to share about this? Yeah, I think um, in terms of the research, um, really our studies have shown that across the board for just about any cause, women are more likely to give. And when you compare similarly situated uh, men and women in terms of income, education, wealth, um, women are giving more uh, to almost every cause as well. The one exception is for those studies that happen to split out, and this is very random because not every study does, um, sports. Uh, as you know, youth sports, for example, or, or sports leagues uh, as a separate uh, area of philanthropy, uh, then men are, are really getting into that at, at higher rates than women. Um, and so really the, the answer is, uh, and as we've kind of been hammering uh, you over the head with, women matter in philanthropy, women are driving philanthropy. So no matter what cause you are advocating for, if you're not reaching women, you're really missing out on this, this core group of donors and potential donors. Um, in terms of, of that knowledge informing strategy, um, I would just say, uh, you know, it, it really matters that you reach out to women. Um, and, and in terms of Jeannie mentioning the pie getting bigger, um, my personal pet peeve, uh, one of many, uh, in philanthropy is, is when nonprofits are, are so competitive with one another. Um, you know, when you look at the for-profit space, you wouldn't necessarily be like, well, there's one clothing store in town. How dare they open a second one? They should really combine, like can't one buy the other out. Like you would never say that about a for-profit. Um, there are different ways of, of addressing different issues. And I think it's so important to have a variety of nonprofits that are addressing a variety of issues. And, and it, it is possible to play nice, to be nice to other nonprofits. It's not about if someone's giving there, they're not gonna give to me. We know that giving is this kind of cumulative additive thing. We know that women who are in giving circles are more generous to other non-giving circle philanthropy. Philanthropy begets philanthropy. And, and so the more that we can see our fellow nonprofits as allies and partners instead of competitors, I think the better off the sector will be. Thanks, Jackie. Um, so our next question um, has to do with data. So I think I may be throwing it right back to you. Um, <laughs> does providing data and research versus inspirational stories impact the motivation of men and women to give? Yeah, I think um, our research has shown, and it, it does sound I, ideal in stereotypes, sometimes working at the Women's Philanthropy Institute and talking about gender differences. Um, so this is not true of every man and every woman, but generally we find that men are more responsive to things like numbers, data, ROI, and women are more responsive to the stories. So, um, and, and it's, it's less about like, women like stories and men like math. Like it's not about that. It's really more about women want to give to individuals. They want to see themselves or someone else in their recipients. And, and they really want that connection with the recipient. Um, men do tend to be check writers when it comes to philanthropy. So they'll write the check, they'll give, they'll be generous they're less interested in the like, tell me the names of the people and more like, I gave you X amount, how many people did you help per dollar? Um, and, and so we do find that the numbers and the stories impact people differently. Um, for, for me, the important thing is, are you doing both? 
Um, so I, I don't think that a nonprofit strategy, a, a fundraising strategy is good if all you're doing is telling stories. And I don't think it's good if all you're doing is saying, here's, here's the ROI for the dollars that you've given. Um, I really do think that you need to integrate it to better appeal to, to whichever side of the brain, uh, whichever type of person that you're working with. Thank you. Um, so you both mentioned giving circles, both within your presentation, but there are a few questions in the Q&A box um, that have to do with them. So can you start by defining and explaining what a giving circle is? Yeah, I can um, jump in and take this one. I've seen the, the questions coming up about giving circles. Um, a giving circle, in short, it, it's collective giving. So it's when a group of people pools their money. Um, it's often a small amount. Maybe every participant is giving uh, $100 or $1,000, et cetera. And then together, the group decides how to give a larger grant. And so you have examples of, um, you might have heard of Impact 100, which is a women's giving circle that has a number um, of different giving circles in different locations. Um, but it's essentially the concept is a group of 100 women each give $1,000 and then they can give a collectively bigger grant of $100,000. And, and so um, you have a lot of variety. I'll drop a link in the chat here in a second. Um, a lot of variety in terms of the size. It might be uh, five people gathered around a kitchen table. You have giving circles that are very formal that vote. You have giving circles that are smaller and are consensus built. So it's just um, a giving circle is shorthand for collective giving, pooling money, granting out and enabling people um, who can only give like a, a limited amount um, to really make a bigger impact by pooling their, their giving. Um, so I'll, I'll drop a couple links um, in. We do often throw out, we're, we're the research base and we often throw things for, for the how-to uh, to groups like philanthropy together. So I'll drop a couple links in the chat here in terms of if you want to join or if you want to create a, a giving circle. Um, you know, in, in terms of impact, it, it can be like, we're only giving one grant a year, we're only giving two grants a year. Um, you might feel like there's a limited impact, but I just think that our research shows giving circles are, um, it's not just about the grants they give, it's about the transformation that you as a member and you as a member of your community go through learning about different nonprofits and learning about yourself as a philanthropist. So I'll drop a few links in here. And it's so important to have those conversations with your group of girlfriends, like you said, around a dinner table. Those can be transformative in, them, in themselves. Um, and so you are planning to drop um, a link that includes resources too? Okay, perfect. Um, so our next question, um, the participant asked, you said to be specific in the ask regarding the gender of the recipient. Is that potentially offensive? And how do I navigate this as someone who is doing that solicitation? So I, maybe you can help me with, with, with understanding um, specific in the ask regarding the gender of the recipient. So I'm, I'm, I, I'm imagining this is about the idea of understanding who, having the conversation about who's making decisions in the household. Becky, do you read that the same way? Yeah. Um, so if that's the case, what, what we're saying is that essentially don't make assumptions about um, who is the decider. Um, you, you want to make sure that um, you, you weave into your conversation um, if you are working with just um, one or the other in a household, um, that you fully understand um, how how those kind those how those decisions are made. So, um, so for instance, if I was I was navigating an ask or or creating a strategy around an ask, um, part of my 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 lead up in terms of questions would be, um, you know, should we would you like to include your partner um, in this next conversation that we have? And so it's not making an assumption um, that that partner has to be there. But it's an invitation to be to be sure that you are um, you are including everybody um, in that conversation. 
So that's probably the nicest way to navigate so that we're not, you, you're not, a, you, and, and I know this has happened. Um, in fact, this this came up in a, in a, in a, a panel discussion we had the other day about, um, and she had said, you know, we, they have the, the woman that serves on the board. How do I not offend her by saying? <laughs> so I know you're on the board and you have spent the last 10 years, you know, serving our mission and, um, you know, advocating for us and, and amplifying our work. Um, are you sure your husband shouldn't be at our, uh, are you sure I shouldn't include? Yeah. So I, so I'm absolutely sensitive to, um, to your question um, and get that, but I would say, try and think of it as an invitation um, and, and, and weave that kind of language into ensuring that all the right people are at the table um, when you're when you're when you're making making that. I would just add to me it's a question of curiosity. So it's less about saying that's a woman's name on my list and when I call her I'm going to talk about um, empathy and the individual life she's going to touch and I'm not going to bother her with any numbers and I'm you know all of that like it's more about curiosity and realizing, I think if our, our research has anything, it's, well, women matter in philanthropy, you need to pay attention to women, but it's also that every donor is different. And so you can't go into the conversation assuming that you know why someone is giving, what they want to give to, um, and, and where they want where they want to give, who they want in the conversation. Um, so it's less about saying you're a woman, therefore I know you want to do things like this. And it's more about saying I know that men and women tend to to come at this for different reasons or give to this um, in different ways. I'm going to ask who else should be involved in this conversation. Should anyone else be involved in this? Um, you know, tell me your story. Tell me what made you passionate about giving to this. Um, do you have a donor advised fund? Is there some other way that you give or are you interested in learning about other ways to give? It's not saying you should do this or you should do that or we should really call your husband. It's none of that. It's being inquisitive and curious um, based on knowing that a lot of donors do things very differently. Um, and wanting to be really open to all of those uh, possible avenues. What I take away from what you both said is to remove assumptions and to be more inclusive. And so if you kind of keep, and also to be curious to your point, Jackie, I think if you kind of weave in all three of those aspects, then um, kind of remove the potential to be um, potentially offensive as the question asks. Um, so it looks like we have one more question in the Q&A box. So if you want to get your last minute um, question in for our panelists, please feel free to drop that in um, while they are answering the last one um, that's right here. So the question asks, it seems like organizations that I have worked with as a volunteer on an advisory board seem to use the ever-present donor list. How can we get beyond that? That is a great question, um, and and what it is is again back to this idea of kind of breaking the model, um, and so you know we tend to 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 resort to best practices, right? So the ever present donor list is are those who are closest to us, um, and so let me approach approach this um, from a different angle, um, which was which is. If we want to be more inclusive and we want to think about bringing um uh, and we want to be intentional about bringing more donors of color in particular to to our organizations certainly women so those strategies are going to have to be different and so you have to you have to not look at the ever-present donor list because generally those donor lists reflect the current donors <laughs> And the people that are already kind of giving and, and what you've said as an organization is, is we want to expand outside of that. And so that requires work and that requires specifically asking people to think outside the box and think outside the donor list. And then also creating, again, accessible points. So creating opportunities for people who might not always be um, 
might not have your organization on their radar screen because they don't have friends that volunteer there or they don't have friends that donate there. They might very, you know, they might know what you do, but if, if they're not feeling included and they don't see other people who look like them or are from their own circles being involved, then they're not going to, they're, they're not going to be involved. And so it requires kind of deliberate efforts on the part of the board and the volunteers and, um, and the advisories to go outside of that. And so you really have to think about what does that look like and what does that mean? And so that means, you know, in some cases that means um, finding, you know, one or two people who, who are willing to kind of go outside the box um, and, and, and engage and invite people in. But then it also might mean for the staff to recreate um, and um, and think of different ways um, that are more comfortable um, for people who might who might not normally be engaged to be engaged. Jackie, you're the fundraiser, and I am the researcher. So I think you you really hit it. Great. Thank you both. Um, so we have one more question. And this uh, participant asks, have you seen different trends in behavior of women by industry or college type? For example, a business school of a large public university versus a small liberal arts college. All right. Um, so, so honestly, I do not think that we have looked in, in that uh, much depth. We tend to look at education broadly or, or higher education if we're going to get specific. Um, what I will say is that a lot of research has been done about um, one of the, so one of the easiest ways to, to look at gender differences is to look at single women and men. Um, and then another way to look at gender differences is to see how married or cohabiting couples, um, you know, kind of see what comes out of there, see, see what preferences come out and kind of understand the gender dynamics within those relationships. Um, and so one way that that is interesting is in higher education because often college educated people will marry or cohabit with one another. Um, what we have found is uh, kind of the shorthand for it is women are more likely than men to give. When they get married, what kind of transfers in from the woman's side for, for your kind of typical heterosexual relationship um, is, is that desire to give. Often you'll have a single woman and a single man, she has been giving, he hasn't, they get married and all of a sudden the household gives. The issue is where they give. And even if they both have an alma mater, more gifts and larger gifts are going to his alma mater. And it is like, it's the most frustrating thing. And we talk to um, women's colleges and, and girls schools quite often who are like, the girl school girl and the guy school guy are getting married and they're only giving to his school. And it's something that really is going to require, I, I mean, there's no quick fix for that, um, but there is that gender dynamic of there's an alma mater for each person and the man's alma mater gets more of the dollars. Um, and it, it's really, I, the shorthand I have for it is that the woman is just like, well, at least we're giving. Um, you know, so it's fine. It's fine if it goes to his alma mater. Um, and, and so that, that's my shorthand for it. And that really is going to require um, intentional outreach um, to your, your women alums um, and really talking to the whole household uh, about why give to your school, um, why, why invest. Um, and, and it, it it's going to require a bit of a culture shift too. Uh, and we know that that is coming and it's just a very, very slow process. But that is, if you've kind of seen that dynamic or you've seen it in your relationship or someone else's relationship, you're not imagining it, it's definitely a thing. But that's as close to an answer about uh, the specific type of school. It really just depends on who your alums are. And if anyone's interested, uh, we we I had an all male school reach out about creating a women's leadership giving circle. So, so <laughs> to 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 put an exclamation point on Jackie's uh, 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 share shared findings. Um, there's that. So <laughs> that was a great question and a 
um, an answer that we can think about and think of ways um, to be creative in how um, we tackle those difficult conversations. There's a, another question that came through um, that I'll give Jackie the, the um, chance to answer because this is a good one. Um, and, it, and it goes to the, the idea of wealth, education, and income influencing um, giving. Jackie, does this change when married um, related to who has who is the higher earner? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, we, we have kind of a nuanced answer there. Um, in terms of uh, married and cohabiting couples um, and who decides, because the, the household is usually giving as a unit, they usually have shared finances in, in most households um, that we see. And so when you look at who decides, the income between one partner and another actually doesn't seem to matter. If there's a big education gap, that does matter. Um, and, and so, it, you know, the, the man is more likely to decide for the household if he has a much higher education than a spouse uh, or a partner, et cetera. And, and that's in our, our Women Give 2021, uh, How Households Make Giving Decisions report, if you're looking at our complete research library for that. Um, we have done some work and it has been too long for me to give you all of the specifics, um, but, but we do know that money matters. Um, and so when women, um, when their incomes increase, they do give, when people's incomes increase, their giving increases. Um, but for women, it increases more than for men. Um, and, and so I do not recall the exact numbers, um, but income does matter. Uh, for, for each individual too. So if, if you have a household where the woman just gets a huge bump in, in pay or in wealth, um, that household's giving will go up um, by a higher amount than if the man gets that in, in bump in pay. Yep. Thank you so much, Jackie. Um, it looks like we are all set with the questions. Thank you um, everyone for submitting one before the event and also during um, thank you to everyone who joined tonight, and again to Jackie and Jeannie from WPI, um, to President Bolton for opening this important series, um, and our partnership with Create Her, which is an on-campus initiative that aims to inspire women to be confident leaders through education and mentorship. Um, and as a reminder, if you did enjoy tonight's event, which I know all of you did, um, we have three additional events throughout the month of April, starting next Tuesday. Um, and at the conclusion of our series, we will be requesting um, your feedback through a survey. So um, keep your eyes peeled for that in your email. And thank you so much for joining us tonight.